for coming out. Thanks for staying for this important conversation about the future of our city and the next leadership team that we will have in place in City Hall. I am Carrie Moon, and I am so excited to be here. I can't believe how much energy I have because I've been doing this all day. This is probably the hardest week of the campaign. But I really love being in community talking about the future of our city together. I'm an engineer. I'm an urban planner. I've been working in this city for 20 years on how to build a great city. I am here not because I want to be a politician. I am here because I care about working together with community to be the greatest city in this country. I have worked with city departments like Department of Neighborhoods doing neighborhood planning, with SDOT, with Department of Parks. I've been on the Design Commission and many other advisory boards and committees because I care deeply about this city. I have worked for 20 years on making a better city and I'm ready to do that from the mayor's office because I believe that while we know solutions to our most challenging problems, what we lack is political courage. And that is what I want to bring to the mayor's office. I am not beholden to corporate donors. I am not beholden to the status quo. I believe that we have real solutions ready to go. And if we work together between community, between council, and the mayor's office, we can implement the bold solutions we need in homelessness, in housing affordability, in building an economy that works for everybody based in local ownership, local business, and the 21st century industrial economy. And I believe we can tackle the issues that face us around transit by getting ahead of this growth with transit-oriented development and increasing transit, biking, <coughs> walking facilities. Because we know as we grow denser that we need to offer modes, alternative modes so people don't need to take their car everywhere. So I'm ready for a great discussion for you tonight. I know you're active, and I know you're energized, and I know you care about your neighborhood, and I'm ready for this discussion. Thank you so much. Good evening. Uh, we're the last round. The good news is you can leave when we're done. Um, <laughs> appreciate everyone being here, and I will tell you, I'm Jenny Durkin, running for mayor. Um, originally born and raised in the Seattle area. My mom was born and raised here also, and I could not be more excited about running for mayor. And the main reason is rooms like this. I will tell you that when Donald Trump was elected, the world started spinning a little bit differently for me. Um, it was my older son's first election, and leading up to the election, we were involved in discussions and campaigns and, and talking about the future of our country and getting him involved and telling him how we can all make a difference. And then the election turned out like it did. And having to sit and have those conversations with him and my younger son and talk about, you know, what does the world we're sitting in today look like? This election is not about who's going to be mayor for four years. This election is about what will Seattle be like for that next generation. You know, this city has changed so rapidly. Just in the last five years, we had tens and tens of thousands of people. And Seattle wasn't ready. You know, we were this town kind of built for the 70s, 80s, and 90s. And now we've had this tremendous growth, and we, nothing was ready. Our transportation infrastructure wasn't ready, and it's creaking and has been a disaster under the growth. Our social service and safety net infrastructure wasn't ready, and that's why we have the homeless problem that we do. And our housing infrastructure wasn't ready. We were not ready for tens and tens of thousands of people earning $100,000 or more to move here in five years. You know, if you look, last week I had an interview with someone from Amazon who was uh, employee number 15,000. They're now an employee 50,000, and they're all earning over $100,000 a year. We've got to fix the issues in front of us, but we can do it. We can do it because people care. You care or you wouldn't be here. I look forward to answering the questions tonight. Thank you. Okay, so the first question we'll start with you, Carrie, is, and, and there's a, a minute and a half of these questions. In your view, what are the basics of city government? That is a really good question. No one ever asked that. So I believe the mayor's job is to be create the vision, champion the vision, lay out an action plan so everybody in city government can be pulling together towards the same solution. Because in this time of flux and transformation with such rapid urban growth and things changing so quickly around us, we all need to understand where we're headed and how we're going to get there together. So that's the main job of the mayor's office. 
but 90% of the work of the city is delivering ba basic services, clean water, safe streets, public safety, and I am ready to lead on that when I get into office on November 29th, because I've been setting up a structure uh, in the past month, because I really believe that we've created a problem that we didn't need to create in the mayor's office, where there's so little management experience and so little capacity to actually lead the 11,000 folks who work for the city, that our cities become ineffective, inefficient, and ineffectual. We are not getting ahead of these challenges that we're facing, and a lot of it is due to poor leadership. So in my career as an engineer, this was one of the things I really focused on, how to build public will, how to build collective will towards a shared goal, set up the structures to do it, set up efficiency, decision structures that make sense to everybody to make sure that we can get to work implementing these solutions that we've identified in my action plan for the future of our city. So I'm really focused on delivery of basic services, but also the most effective government in this city, in this country. <laughs> so when I announced my campaign, I announced with a platform, a very specific thing I thought we needed to conquer and go forward, to move forward as a city. And the first thing I talked about was basic city services. Because the mayor's first job is to make sure that those city services get delivered as promised for reasonable prices at the right pace. And we've all seen when it doesn't happen. Mayor Nichols from West Seattle, one snowstorm, and that anything else he did didn't matter. And so it is critical. So basic city services include making sure the potholes are actually filled making sure that streets are passable, making sure when you pick up the phone and call 911, a police officer or a firefighter actually comes and responds, making sure that we have enough police officers and firefighters that you sometimes don't even need to call 911. They're in your community. They know who you are. <coughs> it means that our parks are kept up. It means those trash is picked up, our utilities work, the things that ties together that basic social compact that's the first job. But in this time, I will say the job's bigger than that for the mayor. And I think it's one area where Carrie and I disagree. She thinks the mayor's job is just to set a vision and then the government will run itself. I know from running offices, that doesn't work. A mayor has to be engaged, has to be engaged and hold people accountable. So it's not just about setting the vision, it's about providing that leadership and getting things done. And so we'll, we'll stay with you, Jenny. So choosing one of the basics that you just listed, can you give us some specifics on how your administration would improve on it? Yes. Um, I'll use police because it's one thing that I think that in our city is one of the closest things that people have connection with. And there's a number of ways that I will have specific things. First is we have seen property crime rates increase significantly throughout Seattle. And we've seen small businesses have problems in a variety of ways, where people don't even call the police anymore. And one of the things that has happened is we have moved away from our community policing model. And we used to have a thing called community safety officers, who they would walk the streets and they would know everyone on their beat. They know the business owners. They know the people that live there. They know the people who were homeless. And we've gone away from that model where police are in cruisers and cruise through. So I would return to a more of a community policing model. I'd add community safety officers. And I would increase the number of both police officers and firefighters because their ranks have been depleted by retirement. We think we've hired a lot, but the net effect is less. So I would, I would hire more, and then I would make sure that in police reform that we finish the job. The judge may decide that the Seattle Police Department is in what they call full and effective compliance. Everyone thinks that means they're done. It isn't. Under the consent decree, which I pushed through and signed, that means for the next two years, we have to make sure we stay in compliance. So it means staying on top of training, staying on top of all the reform efforts that we're doing. The mayor has got to lead on that. The mayor's got to understand how the police department works. Karen? Can you repeat the question? Sure. Choosing one of the bases you just listed, can you give us some specifics on how your administration would improve on it? Okay. So first, I just want to say I'm surprised to hear my opponent say that she started her campaign with solutions, because as I remember, for the first three months of her campaign, the platform section said, this page still under construction. 
So I, I didn't see those solutions, and I haven't heard them until the past couple of weeks. I think, you know, the city is about leadership. It's about empowering people to do their jobs, inspiring them to do their jobs, and then holding them accountable to do, the, accountable to do their jobs. And that's the kind of leader I'm ready to be in every single department in this city. So an example specifically is SDOT. I think we're all frustrated with what's happening in SDOT. There are so many construction projects that are difficult to navigate and you're wondering who's in charge here. So we haven't done a good job of construction planning. I would make sure to look at coordination and make sure we privilege pedestrians and transit when we do the rerouting of traffic around construction sites. It's always so frustrating when you have to walk three blocks out of your way to cross the street. We can do better than that. We have a Move Seattle levy, we have a transportation benefit district, we have two major levies that are funding transportation projects in this city. And we need to do an excellent job making sure we are prioritizing the projects that deliver the most effective results for communities. And I think we have sort of lost track of what that is within ESCOT. We are not prioritizing the right things, which to me would be transit priority, transit only lanes, and making sure we have additional transit service in the transit dependent communities, especially in the southern part of West Seattle. You'll answer this question first. So the next question is, it seems over the last few years, the basics of running our city have been ignored. The citizens have passed a number of levies, moved Seattle housing, and there have been tax increases. Are we getting our value for this investment? You know, I think that's something we should all be asking. Uh, the budget, because of all the levies, because of our property value increases, the assessed value is so much higher, the city now has roughly 25% more money than it had four or five years ago. And I think we should all ask, what are we getting for that increase? And so I think that means we gotta do some belt tightening. We, you know, I have a friend who runs the, inter the national organization, the Mayor's Innovation Lab, and he jokes that Seattle's always called the land of 10,000 pilot projects. Because we start things, and then we don't remember to go back and scale up what works and shut down what didn't work. So I think there's a lot that we could do just to tighten our belts and make sure we are delivering basic services most efficiently. And then I think we need to really focus on, sorry, I lost my train of thought there. <laughs> um, I'll end with that. I'll use the rest of the time on another, on another question. Sure. It seems over the last few years the basics of running our city have been ignored. The citizens have passed a number of levies, moved Seattle housing, along with tax increases. Are we getting our value for this investment? That is such a great question, and I think I am the only candidate of the 21 originally, and now the two of us, who has said, I will not talk about raising any new taxes until I can assure myself that we have really used the money we're getting efficiently. And the reason for that is we have increased taxes over and over again for the things we care about. We are really a generous city that has progressive values and we wanna make sure that we fund the things we care about. So we tax ourselves for buses, for parks, for schools. And, but we're not using all that money in the best way possible. I'll give you examples. Some of those, of those key city services are now being paid for by the special levy money. So when those special le levies expires, we will suddenly either have to raise taxes or renew those levies just to pay for those basic services. So coming in as a mayor, you have to make sure that you are looking budget by budget to see exactly how we're spending our money and how we're collecting our money. I'll give you an example. There was an article in the paper about a month and a half ago. It used to be developers on the old system could get more development space if they paid into a fund. There was one developer with a pretty small development who owed the city about $3.4 million for this, and the city just forgot to collect it. Just forgot to collect it, $3.4 million. And this is when we're looking for money to solve homelessness, addiction services, mental health treatment. So we have to assure ourselves that the money we're getting, we're using wisely. Okay, so on the table in front of you are two pieces of paper. One says yes, one says no. So we have some quick, quick questions. First one, do you support HALA in its present form? <laughs> yeah. Some of it? Yeah. That's a big question.
question. So, so, <laughs> so we have a big answer for you. Right. <laughs> so are you willing to support alternatives to, to Sound Transit's proposed alignment of light rail to West Seattle? Will you reconsider the prior administration's breakaway departure from supporting the district council system? Mm, yes. Will you Not just consider, do it. Will you work to move the Office of Economic Development from a reactive department to a proactive <laughs> department? Yes. Do you feel that the recently passed rules and regulations over small landlords are burdensome and excessive? Over small landlords? Over small landlords. And the final yes, no. Should public funds be spent to influence the acquisition <coughs> of a sports team and build an arena? Hell no. <laughs> <laughs> All right. So back, back to questions, and, and, and we'll start with you on this beginning. Over the last several years, there has been an apparent lack of concern and outreach from the city of Seattle towards our business community. How will your administration be different? towards our small business community? It will be 100% different. And the way you know that is because of how I've been running my campaign. In this campaign, I've been lucky enough to actually do walking tours of over 24 neighborhoods in Seattle, including at the Junction and other places in West Seattle. And when I end, I sit down with small business owners and their employees to talk to them about how's it going in the city. And I hear common refrains over and over again. The first is, no one asks us or talk to us before they roll out the policies. And so I have proposed that I will have a small business advisory council that will be meaningful and will actually be part of the policy development at the table before we roll out policies so we can know what impacts those policies will have on both the businesses and their workers. The second refrain I hear is, it is harder and harder for businesses to make it because their costs are increasing as the rents go up. So I have made very specific proposals on how we keep those commercial rents down so that we can keep those good businesses in our neighborhoods. Everyone's got their favorite small restaurant or shop that they walk to. It's the fabric and hue of our neighborhoods. They employ four to five times as many people as Amazon. Think about that. Our small businesses in Seattle employ four to five times as many people as Amazon. They're the number one economic engine, but they get very little attention. So I will work relentlessly with small business to make it better for them and better for their employees who are traveling farther distances to earn minimum wage, and we've got to help them. So I come from a small business family. We had a manufacturing company in Michigan that employed about 100 people, and I spent some of my career working there as well as in other manufacturing companies when I was an engineer. I know how important small business is. Most of the jobs we create are created in small business. It is how you keep wealth in community circulating back into community to build lasting economic security and resilience. The more big corporations take over our city, the more they are extracting wealth from our city and sending it off to their investors back on Wall Street. We need to intentionally focus on expanding, growing, supporting our small business economy in this city. And our city's OED has neglected small business for too long. So what I would propose is written out in a very comprehensive platform um, that I put on Medium. You can find it from my website. But it's about intentionally bringing together small businesses by sector, not everybody all at once because everybody's concerns are different, to really hearing from them on what they need. It's about technical assistance to small business, especially for immigrant and refugee communities and small business that don't have a big HR department or public affairs department. We need to help them understand the regulations and the protections. And we need, most importantly, a 21st century industrial strategy. Yes, we have tech jobs here and they're good jobs, but we really need to focus on keeping and sustaining a 21st century green industrial economy going in our city because that's where innovation happens, that's where wealth gets created, that's how you create a resilient, sustainable economy. And there's a lot more, but I'll stop there. Okay. So a large part of our West Seattle community will be impacted by the upcoming Fontenoy Boulevard project. How will your administration work to make sure that all departments are in alignment to lessen the impacts of major road improvement projects on our business community. Do you think that our city government has learned lessons from prior projects, specifically the 23rd in Jackson and the Belltown projects? We'll start with Carrie on this one. So I hope we've learned lessons because we've made a lot of mistakes. 
You know, there's a distinction I just want to point out that when we tore up the seawall and we were going to make more access more difficult to the waterfront businesses, they negotiated a $15 million mitigation fund for themselves from the city. We did zero for the businesses on 23rd. And that's deeply unfair and it's unjust and we need to do better because if businesses want to survive through a construction project, we've got to keep communication open, we've got to help them stay supported, and this goes beyond, like what Lorena Gonzalez says, we can't just put out a sandwich board saying this business is still open. We have to do a lot more intentional outreach to community to keep access to the business viable and make sure that they can keep having keep having space for their customers to get to them throughout the whole construction process. And it might be might mean doing some mitigation like we did for the waterfront businesses. So I think we need to listen in advance. We need to talk to the neighborhood about what you need to survive construction and negotiate a pretty good deal with the neighbors so that they have what they need to survive. And we also need to stay in constant communication. Is what the city is doing working? And how would you improve it? Are your customers finding you? What can we do to help? Because we need to protect and support small businesses. We cannot afford to lose a whole street's worth of small businesses in such a fragile economy like you have in West Seattle. So as mayor, I will make sure I work with SDOT and all the other departments to coordinate construction and follow through on what you need to thrive. So this is a great question. It's one, I won't give you all the details, but go to my website because I have put out specific proposals and how to pay for them on these issues. Because talking to small businesses, this was just not on 23rd, and not just for Falkenroy when you're talking about the whole street and when the city acts. Downtown in every neighborhood, as all this co construction occurs, sometimes roads or a lane of a road are just closed. Sometimes there's detours so people can't get to their businesses. I've heard from small businesses everywhere in the city about how this growth is impacting them, and the city hasn't been a good partner. They just haven't been. Um, so there's a couple things we have to do. When the city is doing the project, like that one, we have to make ahead of time to plan with the businesses, plan with the residents to make sure that we're mitigating. And we also have to have a phase time so we really tell people how long it's going to take. The other thing that happens with the city is it's like one foot in front of the other. First it's SDOT, then it's utilities. They don't work together ahead of time. All these mega projects I have proposed and I will require, my directors will make sure that the program managers from each of those departments are working together and have a whiteboard in a room if they need to so they can plan the flow of a project to get it all done. Because too often they're in silos on these big projects. They take longer than they're supposed to. They'll tear up one part of the road, close it up with a metal plate, and the next day a different people come and tear it up. We've got to stop that with these small, with these projects. So there's a whole range of things we can do to help the businesses and the residents stay in place. Okay, we'll stay with, with you on this, Jenny. So in light of the rapid pace of development across the city of Seattle, what thoughts do you have on increasing the green space available to the city's residents in what are rapidly becoming very dense sections of our city? You know, everyone's heard about HALA, which is the Housing Affordability and Livability Agenda. And we have been so focused as a city on the housing affordability part of it, which is a right thing because we're in a crisis, but hardly anyone talks about the L part of it, the livability part. And that has to be embedded as much as the affordability part. Because remember, it's not about just solving the problems in the next two and four years. We really are building that city for the future. And one of the things that has always been special about Seattle, always been special, is our connection to our green space and our outdoors, the water, the mountains, the parks. That's who we are. But it's forgotten. I live downtown now, and you can walk a long ways. I've got a small dog, and to try to take that dog somewhere there's green space, you've got to walk a long distance. And you're seeing that more and more with developments. And if they have a plaza, it's a cement plaza. So I think we really have to go back to requiring more green space, more tree canopy, preserving it where we can, have more public realm where that's available. You know, our parks are such a critical part of who we are. And if you look at the great cities of the world, you can turn a corner and suddenly there'll be a small pocket park where people are just sitting. Uh, we're missing that in the way we're building out our city. 
So whether it's transient-oriented development, like Lorena Gonzalez was talking about, or as we're doing developments, or as there's space that comes available, city lots, we should be thinking about green space. Okay. So I have a master's degree in landscape architecture and urban design, because to me, the physical environment is crucial to build healthy society and health, a healthy city. I started the People's Waterfront Coalition back in 2004 because we had the opportunity to either build a new highway on the downtown waterfront and let WashDOT control it, or reclaim that land as 22 acres of civic space at the heart of our city, committed to creating a healthy public life around touching the water, around fun, active activities going on in the park, around reconnecting the street grid back into the urban fabric. I won many awards for this work because people really recognized that we need to build a sustainable, inclusive, welcoming park related to the water on our most valuable public land in this city. And I'm really proud of that work and all the awards I won from national organizations to the Stranger Genius Award to Municipal League Citizen of the Year, because building that kind of public will for public space is the kind of mushy work that happens in advance of a project becoming visible to the public. And it's actually pretty similar to the work a mayor does, setting the vision, building the public will, and building a collaborative, a collaborative effort to execute that vision. So yes, I care deeply about parks. I raised two kids in the city with in a 1,200 square foot apartment. Actually, it was 800 square foot. And we spend a lot of time in parks. And I know that this is part of a healthy, healthy city, and I'm committed to making the greatest parks in the city for everybody, accessible to everybody. Okay. So we'll stay with you on this. A key topic for the West Seattle Peninsula is the West Seattle Bridge Transportation Corridor, which carries 120,000 vehicles a day. How will you expand vehicle and transit capacity from the West Seattle Bridge to SR-99, SOTO, and I-5? So Chaz and I, a long time ago, were involved in effort, the effort to build the monorail, and I think we have all been frustrated that when we didn't build the monorail, we didn't do anything instead. And so we've added all this growth and development in the West Seattle Peninsula without adding enough transit service. So we had this idea of this five-star bus rapid transit system that was going to have fast, efficient, reliable, frequent bus service. And it didn't happen because the funding didn't come through. So we have rapid ride, but it's really about a one-star bus rapid transit system when we need so much more. So we absolutely have to find the funding to increase transit service to West Seattle. I have a friend who lives here, and she told me if she doesn't get on the bus by 7 a.m. to get to work, she will watch bus after bus after bus go by full. They don't even stop at her stop. That's simply not right, because everybody in West Seattle would be happy to take the bus to jobs in Soto or downtown if there were service, or at least most of you would. So we have to get more service. We've got to look at how to make sure we're getting the <coughs> best route and the best alignment on sound transit so you get access to that service when it comes online. And we've got to look at alternatives. Can we increase the water taxi? Can we add additional bus routes to serve the rapid ride routes. We've got to be more strategic about how we're investing transit dollars in a neighborhood like yours that is accepting so much growth, but without the additional transit service to keep up with all those trips that are being generated. I don't think there's ever been a decade where West Seattle has been served like it's needed. You know, we build just to what there is, and then West Seattle gets more. And we saw it, you know, when the bridge was out years ago. So we absolutely, you know, we know Sound Transit 3 is the thing that's supposed to connect West Seattle and Ballard with downtown and make it easier in the connection. But we also know it's too far away. So the first thing we have to do is speed up Sound Transit 3 and its delivery to West Seattle. I put out a specific plan on how I think we can shave years off that and, and make the process smoother. The number one thing we need is not more money thrown at Sound Transit. We need less process. We need to make sure that the planners from the city are sitting in the same room as the planners with Sound Transit and that they have authority to take actions to get it done. I've talked to Sound Transit. They've put a very a list of things that they think needs to happen in order for Sound Transit 3 to be sped up. And as mayor, I'm committed to doing that, to make sure that we get out of the silos and plan things. 
And we plan with the neighborhoods at the same time. The things that slows it down the most is that neighborhood siding. But we never start that until too late in the process. As mayor, we'll start that right away. And then we have to get, in the meantime, I proposed more bus services from West Seattle downtown, more rapid ride services. And we have money in various budgets that I think we can pay for, it. and I proposed how we pay for that. Because we know it's going to take too long for Santa Transit to come online, and people need help today to get downtown. Okay, so we'll stay with you on this next question. How do you define our homeless issue? Is it a public safety issue, a public health issue, an economic justice issue? It's all of the above. It's all of the above, and I think I would first define it as a heartbreaking issue. You know, we, we have one of the most prosperous cities in the most prosperous country, maybe in the history of the world. You know, we are building all these shiny new towers, and people are working these jobs, inventing the future in Seattle. And yet we have thousands of people living unsheltered on our streets. And to me, it says we can do better as a, as a city. And so I, one thing we have to get away from, I think, is a one-size-fits-all solution for people who are experiencing homelessness. Because people's stories are different. How they end up on the street, why they end up on the street, and what will get them off the streets varies with that story. You know, an example is we have one of the highest populations of moms with kids living in cars anywhere in the country. Moms with kids living in cars. And until about a year and a half ago, we had hardly any shelter space for families. Our shelter system was also built for the 70s, 80s, and 90s. And so Mary's Place jumped into the gap, as did some others. And now we have better shelters. But as mayor, I'm going to direct the services to families first. But then the other thing we're going to need, and I said I don't want to raise taxes, but I think I may have to come back to you and say, we need more for mental health and for addiction services. We will not turn the corner on homelessness unless we can deal with that. So I, I would call our homelessness crisis a multi-system failure. We have an affordability crisis in our housing market that we have not addressed adequately as a city. We are 50th out of 50 in our state for mental health services. People need help. They're simply not getting it. And we have an economy that is building tremendous prosperity for the lucky few, but it's raising the cost of living for everyone else. So many of our homeless people, our homeless brothers and sisters, have jobs. They simply cannot afford to get housing and pay for the cost of living in this city. I met a young woman and her mom <clears throat> at a forum recently, and what their story broke my heart. They both have disabilities. Their combined income is $1,200 a month, and they pay $900 a month for housing. And they looked me in the eye and they said, we are counting on you. We are this close to being homeless and slipping beneath the surface. We need answers. And so they, they fuel me every day in this campaign. We need to get more low barrier shelters, tiny house villages, sanctioned encampments, and creative innovative solutions like Compass Crossing in place to invite the people who are homeless now outside, sleeping outside, to have a place to come inside, because 90% of the people who are sleeping outside would come inside if we offered them a place that met their needs. That's where we should be investing our resources. Second, we need to solve the housing affordability crisis. We have got to get more public and nonprofit housing in motion. I'll stop there. There's more to say, but we have got to make this the number one priority. Well, you'll be able to say more because that will follow up question to that. So, so you, you've now defined the homeless crisis. Over the last four years, the budget has increased every year for homeless services. So how will your administration be different than what we've experienced over the last four years with the budget increasing, and has the budget increased, the number of unsheltered individuals on our streets has also increased? So we have some things that work, but let's just recognize we are pushing people into homelessness faster than we are helping them out. Um, the city does have good programs in place, the, the outreach that is being done by REACH, the tiny house villages, and the really well-run sanctioned encampments are working. We are working with our shelter providers to get more shelters turned into 24-hour shelters where people can bring their pets and their belongings. 
We tried the navigation center. It's expensive, but it's a necessary solution for folks who have addiction services or who need extra care. But what I would stop is I would stop the sweeps. They are ineffective. They are not working. We are chasing people from one unsanctioned encampment to another without inviting them to come inside. It cost $700,000 last year for the sweeps. It barely helped anybody. All the data shows and they might come inside for a few nights and then they're right back out in the camping. That's not working. I also believe rapid rehousing doesn't work. We are giving people a $200 voucher as if that's going to help them get a $2,000 apartment. It's not enough. And so, and the ones that do find an apartment and their voucher runs out in six months, they're right back out on the street because they still can't afford a $2,000 apartment without help. So we've got to really focus on the solutions that work, be a lot more efficient, coordinate better with King County because they provide the public health services, we provide the homelessness services, they've got to be intertwined. So I think we just need more efficiency and better management of the whole system and to invest in the right solutions. So there's a number of things that I would do different than the last administration. Number one is we can't treat it like a one-size-fits-all. We have to drive the solutions to the different populations that are actually experiencing homelessness if we want to make progress. So we have to get, for example, the moms and kids different services than perhaps the heroin addict who's living in a tent under the viaduct. And if we aren't realistic about that, we won't make progress. The second thing we have to do is make sure that we are increasing our shelter space as quickly as we can while we build the affordable housing. And again, you know, Carrie talks about what she's identified as the problems. I have proposed specific solutions and how much they will cost and where the money will come from. <coughs> For example, I have proposed that every council district in this city come with two to 300 shelter beds immediately. It may be in a community center, in a place of faith, in nonprofits, and every time I'm in a room, people are ready to sign up to help to do that. And if we did that, we would have a thousand beds almost overnight. And then I've said that we will, in my first year as mayor, we will build, start building a thousand tiny houses that will be insulated, that have plumbing and some kind of compostable toilet or facilities. They're not perfect, they're not long-term shelter, but we have to get people out of tents, out of cars, out of doorways, out of RVs. And one big difference between us is, I think it is wrong to let people stay in the unsanctioned encampments. They're unsafe, they're immoral, and we need to move people into shelter. It is not the sweeps we spend money on, it is the services and we've wasted that money instead of helping people. Okay, last question. At what point do you think that, that the sales tax in Levy Bird is too high for the citizens of Seattle? Start with you, again. you know, this is a, a really great question because I think we're close to a tipping point. And a lot of things tell me that because, as I said before, we tax ourselves over and over again for the things we care about. But I was at the 37th District Democrats about a month ago, and someone came up to talk about the veterans levy, which it's one of the most liberal districts there is, and usually people are like all for things. Person after person stood up to speak against it, not because they didn't believe in it, but because they said they couldn't afford to pay for it anymore, and they felt they were getting pushed out. So I think we really have to be careful. When that McCleary amount hits people's property taxes, I think people are going to be shocked because of the deal cut in Olympia that was bad for Seattle, bad for Seattle. You know, they say that it'll only be about 463 bucks in property taxes per average house. But that's a house that's valued at $500,000. And I say, show me where that $500,000 house is because I will buy it. Um, it's going to be a lot more than that. And so I think we're at a tipping point. That's why I am very much in favor of progressive taxes, going and getting an income tax, going to Olympia and seeing if we can get that. But I'm the only candidate who has, <coughs> who has consistently said, if we get that funding, I will use it to pay down the regressive taxes, the unfair taxes, lower property taxes, lower sales taxes. Because otherwise, all government's doing is asking for more money, not being efficient. So I think we have said yes to many tax increases because we're generous. We are at a tipping point. But I want to point out that this is compounded by a rapid increase.
increase in assessed values of our houses, which is being caused by outside speculation happening in our housing market. So the first part of my solution will be to tackle that and to stop this the outsiders who are using our housing as if it's a commodity, as if it's an investment in Wall Street, they're buying up housing sheerly to game the system and escalate the price because then they can sell it, flip it at a higher rate. We have to stop that activity because that will balance out the assessed values and the, the housing affordability crisis. And yes, we need to look at more progressive taxes. Absolutely, I've been saying this since day one. We need to look at a capital gains tax at the state level. We need to look at the disincentive on speculation, which will provide revenue. We need to look at inheritance taxes and estate taxes. We need to focus on taxing the wealth of unearned wealth of wealthy people and not tax the wages and the, and the sales tax that's so regressive on lower income people. So I'm all, definitely I will keep pushing for progressive taxation, both with partners in Olympia at the state level, and also do whatever we can do locally. I think we need to also look at expanding the senior property tax exemption. Right now you have to make less than 40,000 and be over 65. I think we should increase the, the threshold for that so more people qualify. And yes, we need to reduce the burden of sales and property tax, definitely, before we push everybody out. Okay. So now we'll go to closing statements. You each have two minutes, and we'll start with you, Jen. Great. Oh, started you? Yeah. <laughs> I'm teasing you. On you. What's that? On you. Could you start over? <laughs> I did get that. <laughs> thank you so much for coming, and thank you for staying here till the bitter end. Um, I think you've heard a lot of similarities between Carrie Moon and I, and I hear a lot of people say, you know, what's the difference between you? And so as you leave here tonight, I want you to remember two things. One, we really have identified the same problems and challenges facing Seattle. But how we fix them is different. And how we can get it done is different. And the main difference is real experience in solving problems. Carrie has had a great career as a civic engaged person. And I think it's terrific what she has done. But she has not run an organization of this size or magnitude, or had to manage a government agency to make the hard calls, to, to move the bureaucracy forward, to get people moving. And the issues that she has been involved in were issues that were really important to the city. But if you think about it, her main focus was on stopping the tunnel. Stopping the tunnel. She worked hard on that. She admits now that it's done and we're going to have the tunnel. And I will say that as a person in Seattle, I'm glad we're going to have the tunnel because Seattle has changed rapidly in the period of time in which we were fighting about whether we were going to have that tunnel. And if we had to put 20 more thousand cars a day through downtown Seattle, people in West Seattle might as well just stay home because it would be too crowded. You couldn't get from here to there. We have not made the transit uh, things we need to do to improve that. Our roads aren't ready. And, it, and just the opposite, because we are doing the convention center expansion, the bus tunnel will be closed. So all those hundreds of buses are going to be on the city streets. They're going to be tearing up First Avenue for the new trolley. There's going to be construction for the Rainier Tower. So first of 4th and 5th Avenue are going to be closed. This comes down to experience. Who actually can get it done? rather than talk about plans and planning and just collaboration. Look at her website. She says in the first year, she'll get together and come up with a plan. We can't wait for a year. So thank you for being here tonight. It's really great to talk about how we're going to build the future of our city together. And I'm intentional about that because I know that change, transformative change that we need in the city is not going to come from a top-down, bullying approach. It's going to come from building commitment together with community, with the 11,000 people who work for this city, with city council, to really implement the lasting solutions that we need. Since I started this campaign, and more and more every week, people have stopped me on the street. People have jumped out of their trucks, their SPU and city light trucks, to say, we need you. We are counting on you. Because people trust me. People know that I'm ready to lead an effective organization 
in city government. People know my values. They know my integrity. They know I will bring ethics and transparency back to the mayor's office. And that's what the citizens of Seattle are looking for. I've had lots of endorsements. The Stranger, the Weekly, the King County Democrats, four out of the six Democratic legislative districts, countless unions, community groups, small business owners, all the progressive transportation and urbanist communities because they know I understand how to build a great city. And that is what we need in this time of flux. We don't need a politician. We don't need a corporate lawyer and a prosecutor. We need someone who understands urban growth, who understands how to build solutions to be the city we want to be in the future. Inclusive, diverse, creative, affordable, and committed to shared prosperity for everybody. I've talked through solutions for how to achieve each of those goals, and I'm really ready to work together with all of you. Because in this time of transportation, sorry, transformation and flux that we're all experiencing, we need a constructive future vision and an action agenda that everyone can understand so we can all be part of the solution in building the great future for our beloved city. Thank you. Thank you. So I would like to, number one, I'd like to thank Lynn Dennis, the CEO of the West Seattle Chamber, and of Lynn, who has given us great leadership and has helped organize this uh, event this evening. I would like to thank Rick Keller for being our timekeeper this evening. I'd like to thank Chaz Redmond for providing and running the sound system tonight. I'd also like to uh, thank Keith Hughes and the American Legion Hall for hosting us this evening. Candidates for coming out, and I have two more requests. One, you're going to be getting your ballots in the mail over the next few days. I encourage you highly to fill them out and mail them back in. Encourage all your neighbors to do the same thing. The second thing is, is we need to leave this room in the same condition that we found it in when we when we came here tonight. So if y'all would be so kind as to pick your chair up and bring it up here to the front corner, corner, we would really appreciate it. Thank y'all.